Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. Today we're going to talk about audit planning memo and how to get a C on them every single time. If you like what you see, please feel free to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. The agenda for today is that we're going to go through what is a planning memo and what are the components that make up a planning memo. Then we're going to go and look at how to game the system. To do this, I've looked at multiple feedback guides and took out what is the most common and critical points for you to score a C each time. Then I'm going to tell you what are my pitfalls seen as a marker for candidates not getting a C. And then lastly, I'm going to end it with giving you a planning memo template that you can use to get a C every single case. So make sure you stay till the end so you know how to use the template and power through all of the planning memo required on your case quickly with getting all the marks. So whether you're going to do an audit planning memo or a review planning memo, it's going to have the following four components. You're going to first start with your risk and then your approach and then materiality and then procedures. We use the acronym RAMP or RAMP to memorize it. So now let's talk about the audit or risk planning memo components. I say audit and review because the four components are the same in both of them. So now let's first talk about the risk. Many people believe that this risk can be any risk that the company is facing. In today's environment, it could be something like inflation risk. However, inflation risk does not cause the financial statements to be misstated. So what risk we're really talking about here is any risk that actually will cause the financial statement to be misstated. For example, if you have a new controller, because that controller is new, they might make more errors and therefore your statements will be misstated. So when you state the risk, make sure you also state why the risk will make the financial statements wrong. The next section is the approach. There's only two choices for this. The first is substantive testing. This means completing audit procedures that examine the financial statement and supporting documentation to see if there are certain errors. The next is the combined approach. This means it is a combination of a substantive testing and controls testing. What controls testing means is that you will test the control of the company to see if they are actually able to be relied upon. For example, each payment needs to be reviewed and approved by a manager before submitting. If the case tells you that this control is working, then you could say that because there are working controls, we're going to use a combined approach. Or else, if you see that there's a lot of weaknesses in controls or breakdown in controls, then you're probably going to use a substantive approach. The tip here is that you want to use case facts to support whether you're using a combined approach or a substantive approach. When talking about materiality, this is the comfort level that the auditors are willing to bear until they say something is wrong with the statement. For example, if the overall materiality is $1 million, once an error in total is over $1 million, the auditors will say that the statements are materially off, which means it is off to a degree that it will likely impact the user's decisions. The key thing about selecting overall materiality is that it's only based on users, not on risk. Then we come to the performance materiality, which is used for specific line items or sections of the financial statement. It's more of an insurance for the auditors. This helps the auditor know that even though in aggregate the errors are not over $1 million, which is our overall materiality, but maybe one account or two accounts are exceeding a threshold that we don't like. So normally performance materiality is around 60 to 80% of the overall materiality. And this time determining the performance materiality is based on the risk of that line item. The last component of the planning memo is procedures, where we talk about the risk, the assertion, and the procedures of key topics. Usually these topics are your financial reporting topics that you've talked about. And if you need help remembering all the assertions, please check out a video that I have on my channel. Now let's go into our second topic how to game the system. So this is going to be a summary of what I've found in multiple marking keys to help candidates figure out what they actually need to put on their case to get the marks. So now let's see what almost every feedback guide expects you to do. Basically, doing these things will always guarantee you some marks on the feedback guide. Because don't you hate it when you write a ton of things and then none of them get you marks on the feedback guide? So the first thing I noticed when I looked at a bunch of feedback guides is that they're pretty much the same. Almost every planning memo section expects you to do the same thing. The second thing is that materiality should be discussed with at least two users and their objectives, not risk. The next thing would be that when discussing the risk factors, make sure you do a balanced discussion on what increases and decreases risk and why it is a risk. Then depending on the case size, you would usually have four to six risks listed. The next tip is that you need to conclude everywhere. So make sure you conclude after your risk section, your approach, and your materiality. When discussing the approach, just talk about the why, which is usually related to if there is control risk or not. 
and then you can conclude and move on. This section is allocated the least amount of AOs on a case, so don't spend too much time here and waste your time. Next, when doing your procedures, use the risk assertion procedure approach. You usually need to have the risk and why you are doing the procedure to get depth. Now let's go into the top pitfalls that I see as a marker that candidates can easily avoid. So here's the top pitfalls that I've seen as a marker for each section. The first one would be that the risk that you have listed is irrelevant. Many times we have students talk about all the risks in the case except for the ones that actually cause financial statements to be misstated like a change in controller, no controls, bank covenants, or bonus payouts. The next most common risk pitfall is that there's no depth. Everyone just puts bullet points in a laundry list of various risks within the case, but then there's never the explanation of why is it a risk. And without the why, you're never gonna get a C on the section. So you can't just say, that there's a new controller, but you have to say that because there is a new controller, there can be more errors as they are new to the role. When it comes to approaches, make sure you only choose between the two, which is substantive and combined approach. There's no other approach that you should be choosing from. Next, when you know there is going to be weak controls within the case, make sure you use those case facts to support your choice. When it comes to materiality, it's not based on risk. I know I said this a lot during this video, but I can't stress this enough because we always see it with candidates that they talk about risk when it comes to materiality. When it comes to performance materiality, some candidates don't do it or they don't explain what it is. So make sure you do both. If you don't know how to do it, look at the past sample solution, copy what they have done and make it a little less wordy. When it comes to procedures, maybe it's because candidates run out of time, but they don't talk about the risk or assertions and they just go straight into the procedures. But you need to know that no matter how many procedures you write down, without the risk or assertions, you're never going to get that C. So you would rather list less procedures, but include the risk and assertions for all the ones you have written. Many of the times, candidates write procedures on irrelevant topics, and it's not hard to know what are procedures you should write and which ones you shouldn't. If the case has an FR issue, you should write procedures on those issues. My advice is to do procedures right after each one of your FR issues, and then in your planning memo, just state that the procedures are written with the discussions of the FR issues. Lastly, your procedures need to be simple. It needs to be like instructions for cooking a meal. It can't be like, take the pasta, boil, eat. It should be a little bit more clear than that, where it's like how much water to add, how high the heat should be, and how long you should be cooking it for. Just think about it. You want to do things step by step, just like as if you're giving instructions for someone who is in high school. Now let's get into the most important section of this video, which is what is the planning memo template that you should be using every single case to help you get a C. Hopefully you have listened carefully on all the other sections so that this template will make sense to you. Finally, now we can get to the best part of this video, where you will learn how to write a audit planning memo correctly to get a C every time. A key note is that some cases might ask you to do an audit planning memo, but not the risk section or the approach section. So be careful to read if you need to do the full audit planning memo or just parts of it. For the risk section, you can either do it in bullet points or do a chart like the one on the screen. Whichever way you decide to do it, make sure you always include what is the risk, what is the impact of that risk, and if it decreases or increases risk. The reason why you want to write it in this format is because by writing it like this, you would always get the why, which always gets you the depth mark. And then you can also see if you have a good mix of increasing and decreasing risk factors. Again, the risks that you're supposed to state are risk areas that will cause a financial misstatement, not business risk. Then of course, you will conclude. Normally, I see four to six risks are okay for this section, but it really depends on how long your case is. The longer the case, the more risk you identified, the more risk you should write about. In the approach section, you should spend the least amount of time writing this out because it has the least amount of AOs. The key here is to talk about the control risk assessment and then based on that, you should conclude if you should do a substantive or combined test. If in the case it talks about how things were done and tested in prior years, you should also talk about if it's going to be the same or different. Now let's talk about materiality. Make sure you do this section after you go through your financial reporting section because if there are any accounting adjustments, you need to account for them before you start calculating your materiality. I would always start with the users and their objectives. Have at least two users and their objectives laid out. The reason for this is because materiality is based on users only and not risk. Then you would talk about the basis on how you would select materiality. So then this could be based on net income, revenue, assets, and expenses. Again, you want to tie this back to the users. 
and why it's important to them. Usually there's also a range of how much of each category you could use, so you want to state that as well. The more people not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the company that are looking at the statements and that will be using them to make a decision, the lower your materiality should be. If the statements will only be used by the owner who runs the day-to-day -day business, then your materiality can be higher because it's not going to be given to someone that doesn't know too much about the business. Once you have stated the percentage within the range that you want to use, you want to state why you chose that percentage within the range, whether it's a high number or a low number. Then you will show your calculation of what is the overall materiality. However, before you do any calculation, make sure you've already made all the necessary financial accounting adjustments beforehand. Then for an additional mark, make sure you also talk about the performance materiality, which is a portion of overall materiality usually within the 60 to 80% mark. You can choose what percentage you want to use, but you just have to pick a number and then multiply the overall materiality by that amount. And again, you want to show your work for this. If you're not sure what the performance materiality is, then you're not alone. Because when I was writing my exams, I also didn't know what it was. So my advice to anyone writing about performance materiality and wanting to get a mark for it, I would suggest that you read the perfect solution for any audit planning memo case and then see how they talked about it and then just take their wording and then shorten it a little and then use it for every single case that you write going forward. The last template I want to show you is how to write procedures. This is where you start with the risk, which is why you're writing this procedure. Then you write about the assertions, which is what you're looking for when you do your procedures. And then if you're having trouble memorizing what all the assertions are, make sure you check out one of my other YouTube videos where I talk about that. And normally this should be two to three assertions and you shouldn't have a laundry list of them. Then you will end it off with procedures that matches the risk and assertions. It's easier to write procedures in bullet points as it's supposed to be short and instructional. When you write your procedures, Make sure you don't just gloss over various facts and you just tell someone to do an inventory count of the inventory. You have to actually be very descriptive. So you have to say, first you need to obtain the inventory listing, then select 25 items on that list and find it on the sales floor. Then find 25 items on the sales floor and then locate them on the inventory listing. Lastly, many people don't write procedures on the key topics. And how do you know what are the key topics? They're normally your FR topics. And each FR topic usually has two valid procedures allocated to them on the feedback guide. So when talking about those FR topics, make sure you also talk about procedures that are related to the key criterias. And how you know what are the key criterias are those ones that you talked a lot about in your analysis or would have a lot of ambiguity around it and would cause the final conclusion to be different if a significant key fact was different. So not forget writing your procedures for each FR topic. I would suggest that you should write them right after each one of your financial reporting topics. This way you would have the FR topics fresh in your mind. And then in the audit planning memo section, you can just state that the procedures are written under each FR issue. Last tip for everyone is that when you're writing an audit or review procedure, you need to know that they're different. Audit procedures can only include inspection, reperformance, confirmation, recalculation, and observation, whereas reviews can only include inquiry, discussion, and analytics. What this means is that you can only talk to the client, ask them questions, and do some simple math that is like year-to-year -year calculations. It's important that you don't get these two mixed up because you want to demonstrate to the marker that you know what type of procedure you're writing. Thanks again for watching and hopefully you learned something about the audit planning memo and you can use this template in your cases going forward so that you can get a C on each AO as well. If you like what you saw, please remember to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. If you have any questions,